So now we've learned four different ways that you can calculate the enthalpy change for a reaction. So let's just kind of, I just want to summarize those here real quickly. So number one, as we can see here, it says that we use the Q equals MC delta T uh, to find the heat gained or lost, which is the Q value, and then divide by the moles to get joules per mole or typically kilojoules per mole. Remember that when you're, you, when, if there's a chemical reaction that's happening and you're trying to determine what moles do I use, remember that you use the moles of the limiting reactant, which everyone's gonna run out first. Those are the moles that you use to determine when you, after you get the Q value, what you divide by. If they give you two reactants, again, use the moles of whichever one uh, is going to run out first. Okay, number two is you use bond energies. Since breaking bonds always takes energy, that's an endothermic process, and forming bonds always releases energy, an exothermic process, we can use that equation where we take the sum of the bonds breaking minus the sum of the bonds broken, or bonds formed, uh, in order to find the enthalpy change for the reaction. And then number three, using enthalpies of formation, and the chemical equation, and then you take the enthalpies of formation of the products minus the enthalpies of formation of the reactants. Uh, that's a third way to find the enthalpy change. And then of course, the one we just talked about is Hess's law. And with Hess's law, remember you can flip, double, triple, cut in half, add together different equations to get the enthalpy change for a new equation. Okay, so just a couple of examples and then just a little bit of additional information. When we talk about bond energy, so when we're talking about like HOH and we're talking about bond energy, we're talking about the amount of energy it takes to break that bond right there. Okay, what we're not talking about is the attraction between one water molecule and another water molecule. Remember, those are called intermolecular forces okay when you break an intermolecular force for example when water uh, evaporates and turns into a gas that is a physical change because there's no rearrangement of the bonds you're simply breaking intermolecular forces if when when we're talking about bond energy when we're talking about the actual bonds in the molecule breaking then that absolutely is a chemical change okay so let's let's look at this this whole idea of you've got a cup of water and you take some NaCl and you put that those salt particles into the water. OK, so there's three different things that have to happen when you put salt into water. Number one is that the NaCl is breaking down into its ions. OK, so in this case, what is being broken in this process? That deals with the bond energy. Okay, those are the bonds are breaking. Okay, not the intermolecular attractions. The bond, the, the bond between sodium and chlorine is breaking to create sodium ions and chloride ions that are completely separate from each other. Okay, and absolutely, and that's gonna this is gonna come up in a second. Remember, anytime you break bonds or you break intermolecular forces, either one of them, okay, that is an endothermic process. That is a positive delta H, okay? Number two, the second is the water molecules separating from each other. So they're still water molecules, but now they have to make room for the salt to fit in there. So in that case, what is being broken in this process? The intermolecular forces between the water molecules okay so that is so this one here is a chemical process this one here is a physical process and many times people ask so is dissolving sh uh, sugar is, is dissolving salt in water a chemical process or a physical process a chemical change or a physical change and honestly the word that they use, they say it's ambiguous, which means eh, it's both, really. It's, 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 the, the bonds are breaking in one process. The intermolecular forces are changing in another. So, eh, yes, it's kind of physical. Yes, it's kind of chemical as well. Okay, the third event 
is the individual ions, so these sodium ions and the chloride ions, being surrounded by water molecules. And remember, we've learned that with the positive charged sodium, that the oxygens of the water are going to be more attracted to it. Whereas, sorry, those are terrible. The hydrogens aren't even attached there. There we go. That's better. Okay. And then with the chlorine ones, with the chlorine ions, with its negative charge, the hydrogens are the ones that are going to be more attracted to uh, the chloride ions because they have that partial positive charge. Okay, so what is it about water that even allows this whole process to occur is the fact that water is extremely polar. It's got that negative end and positive end, negative end, positive end. Okay, that's what allows that to happen. And because that is polar and these are ions, remember that those are called ion dipole forces. Okay, and then the last question says, which of the three events above is endothermic, which is exothermic? Um, so anytime you break anything, whether it's bonds or intermolecular forces, that is an endothermic process. So here we've got absolutely a positive delta H. Here we have also a positive delta H because, again, we're breaking those intermolecular forces between the water molecules. But then when we're creating new attractions between, in this case, the water and the sodium and the water and the chloride ions, that's forming new attractions. It's not a bond. It's an attraction. That is the negative. That's the exothermic process. Okay? So the first two steps, the salt breaking apart and the water separating from itself are both endothermic. And then the water forming new attractions with these ions is the exothermic process. Now, how do you know whether the whole thing is exothermic or endothermic? Well, again, depending on what you're dissolving in the water, you're going to have two endothermic processes and one exothermic. If the two endothermics are bigger than the one exothermic, then it's going to be endothermic overall. But if the exothermic process is greater than the other two endothermic processes, then it will be exothermic overall. Okay, let's look at an example from a real test. Okay, uh, example one, the enthalpy of dissolution. Again, don't worry about, you know, they're, they're just trying to help you by saying that. Okay, the enthalpy of dissolution means when you dissolve something in water. Okay, the amount of heat that's exchanged or energy that's exchanged when you dissolve something in water is a positive value. Ooh, that tells me that it's a positive delta H, which means that again, these two put together is greater than that one when those new uh, attractions are formed. Based on this information, the student claims that the energy required to separate the ions in AgCl is greater than the energy released during the hydration of Ag plus and Cl minus by water molecules. Do you agree or disagree with this student's claim? Justify your answer. So the energy required to separate the ions in AgCl is greater than the energy released during the hydration of Ag plus and Cl minus. So since the dissolution of AgCl is a positive value and therefore delta H is endo, it's an endothermic process, we can say that we would, I'm going to agree with that statement uh, and say that, of course, um, yes, the amount of energy required to separate the ions in AgCl must be greater than the amount released because delta H is a positive value, okay? Or we could say that more energy was absorbed by the system, remember the reaction itself, uh, than what was released to overcome the attractions uh, that are formed between the water molecules and the Ag plus and the Cl minus. So agree because since delta H is positive, the amount of energy uh, required must be greater than the amount of energy released um, in hydration. Okay.
And that would be a, a perfectly acceptable answer there.